Yes, they absolutely. They absolutely do. I tell you, you know, if you've been involved in, in church or in other churches, uh, and like, of course, I have most of my life, came to the Lord when I was 16 in a little country church. And I say a little country church. It was, it was pretty big and after a while. And uh, anyway, and grew up in that and then uh, pastored churches all my life. You get to, you get to see um, uh, the people and, and, and things that make a church go. And a lot of times people, are, people have the tendency to, uh, to boast about the pastor or the, or the musicians or uh, something like that. But I'm telling you, there are just so many, many people that are behind the scenes that no one ever sees that makes everything what it is. And without it, uh, you couldn't have it. I guarantee you, you let, uh, you let four or five of these uh, river kids get in here and get all wound up at one time. We'd, we'd get to see how much of a service we could have with that going on. But we have people that take care of them and do all kinds of things with our children and nurseries and, and make things available to us. So thank you all. Thank you guys for doing everything you do to make it where we can, uh, where we can come together and hear a word from the Lord and uh, hopefully have the Lord touch our hearts. Uh, I'm going to share a message today. Um, you know, I always, I'm always looking at Christmas time, and I said this last week, that when you've been, when you've been pastoring for 48 years, that means you have at least 48 Christmas sermons. Uh, maybe more, because some years, you know, you're going to preach two or three messages in December around the theme of Christmas. So there's just lots of variety of things that all through the years that I've done and heard other pastors do and so forth. So, you know, as you, cru as you cruise along here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right at 66 and, you know, we've been in the ministry a long time and been with people in church and heard many things about Christmas. So you, I'm all, I say that to say that I'm always looking for something novel about about a message, you know, something that would might be uh, maybe not new, but something that would be uh, a little bit different for us to consider at Christmas time, besides just the story of Christmas, as great as it is and as wonderful as it is, um, you know, there are some things that the Lord might be trying to say to us at Christmas time. Well, this year I was reading Luke chapter one, and in Luke one, this is when... Um, the, Mary, uh, the angel comes to, Mary, to Elizabeth and tells her that she's going to be with child. She's old, older, excuse me, and she's with the child. And then he comes to Mary and he starts telling Mary about all the things that are going to happen with her and so forth. And then he tells, her, tells Mary, you know, uh, hey, look, uh, the same things happened to Elizabeth. So Mary, you're not by yourself in this. And she gives them, and anyway, the, the, as you read through the story, what began to dawn on me this year was how God continually manages to change the plans in life. Because I'm sure that Mary had no plan to have a baby. I mean, I'm sure she wanted to have one someday, but not, you know, not before their wedding was announced and the wedding was done and over with. I'm sure, you know, Elizabeth had no plans whatsoever to be a mother, even though Zacharias was in the temple praying for it all the time. They're about 90 years old. And the childbearing ages are, have long been passed, but there's been a change of plans. I'm sure Joseph, one of the unsung heroes of the Christmas story, guys, Back me up on this now. Uh, <laughs> don't get yourself hurt, but back me up on this. I mean, think about what happened with Joseph. I mean, he, he, he's engaged to a young lady that he loves, and, and, and they've been together for some time, and they've been pure. They've kept himself chaste, and she was still a virgin, and I'm sure that that was the plan that, we'll, that when we get married, you know, then we'll be involved with each other, but not before. And, um, and he was a good man, a carpenter, worked hard every day, you know, was preparing for a wedding. They were planning a wedding. It was going to happen real soon. And all of a sudden, his fiance goes out of town. She goes to her aunt Elizabeth's house. And she stays there for four months. And when she comes back into town, uh, there's something different about Mary. 
I mean, when she left, she was Mary the lean. When she came back, she was the Mary obviously with child. And I can imagine on the job, you know, <laughs> somebody comes up and says, Joseph, did you know Mary's back in town? No, I didn't. You've seen her? Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you, she's back in town and I'm, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but I, I, man, I thought you were, I thought you were going to keep your vow to be pure before marriage and all that kind of stuff. And he said, what you talking about? He said, well, you know, she's, she's a little, mm. and then Joseph has to go find out about this. No angel came to him and told him about this. Not until after. I mean, it's like the angel didn't come until four months later to talk to Joseph about it. You know, why couldn't they talk to him at the same time? I mean, it just seems like God delights in surprising us. Now, the thing about God is he's omniscient and he knows everything. So God is never surprised by anything. But I think he really likes to surprise us. I mean, he must, you know, just look at the Christmas story. I mean, here's Mary who is required to leave Nazareth, which is in Galilee, and go down to Bethlehem, which is in Judea, which is 70 miles, and she's nine months pregnant. On the back of a donkey for 70 miles when you're nine months pregnant? Come on, God. I mean, look, I'm respectful to the Lord, and Lord, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way, but this just seems to me to be a case study in poor planning. I mean, it just really, do, it really does. I mean, no, nobody had forethought to book a room in advance. I mean, you got to go down to Bethlehem to pay the taxes and get registered, and nobody says, hey, you know, we might need to book a room down there because Mary's about nine months pregnant and uh, something might happen on the way. We might need to have a safe place to go, at least warm, at least out of the weather. Nobody had any more thought about any of that kind of stuff. And I mean, my goodness, as I mentioned ago, uh, a moment ago, the, these communication issues. Mary, Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're highly favored of God. And that which is born, going to be placed in your body is going to be from God. And then four months later, the angel comes to Joseph after Joseph has already got divorce papers written up. The Bible says that Joseph had decided to put Mary away quietly because he didn't want to, he didn't want to embarrass her, didn't want to, want, to, want to cause her a lot of problem. But he had already decided this. And I'm thinking, Lord, you let Joseph go through all of that agony? All of that anxiety and stress about, I love her, but you know, can I trust her? And I know I didn't do anything, so what is going on here? And then finally, the, Gabriel, the Abra, uh, angel Gabriel comes to Joseph and says, hey, Joseph, I meant to tell you this. I should have told you so, several months ago, but I've been meaning, I, I just slipped my mind, I was so busy. Uh, that... That, 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 uh, that, that marriage end in pregnancy that, 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 that you got here going on with Mary, um, that is indeed an act of God, all right? Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Well, that would have been good news about four months ago uh, and not have to go through all that agony. I, 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 you know, I'm just saying if he had come to them both at the same time, and, and giving them a little heads up about what was coming on, that that would have made the season a whole lot less anxious for everybody involved. And, you know, if you want to go with it, just another little step here, and oh, forgive me. But the whole thing seems a little counterproductive to me. I mean, it seems like, look, it, if you would have given just a, God, if you'd have given us just a little more information and, and made it and give it to us in a timely manner, that we could have had a lot more support for what was going on here in Bethlehem if we had just known a little bit more about it. But no, God evidently loves surprises. Let me read Luke 1, a few verses, Luke 1. 
Now, in the sixth month, now this sixth month is the sixth months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth is Mary's aunt, and she's an older woman, and her husband is Zachariah the priest. He's been praying all this time. She's going to birth John the Baptist. That's who's in her, John the Baptist. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come and having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the, son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old, in her old age. <coughs> Mary, you're, you're not by yourself, all right? Uh, and, this, and she's now in her sixth month, uh, who, and she was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So, what do you do when God shows up and changes your plans? I mean, without consulting your itinerary. Because we all know that we hate for our change, uh, for our plans to be changed, right? Because we always want to be prepared. We always want to be ready. We always want to be in control of things. But remember, when God does change your plan, God doesn't change your plan for no reason. God always has a purpose when he changes your plan. So what do you do when life changes your plan, when God changes your plan? Well, I'm saying all that to say that one of the great places God had to teach us something about this surprise, <laughs> there's a new plan, is Christmas. Because Christmas is such a busy time. And we have so many plans around Christmas, right? I mean, you plan to get together. Most of them involve family, which is extremely frustrating most of the time and can be uh, hazardous to your health, really. Uh, I mean, you, know, you can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your family. Now, that's all I'm telling you. And, and around Christmas, they're all kind of plans, and you gotta, when you have blended families, and you have, you know, you, you, you have grandparents up here and parents down here, and then you got all these others all around. <coughs> I mean, man, the plans can just get outrageous. So I'm just saying this and encouraging you that whatever happens or whatever doesn't happen, this year, that uh, you don't let your plans make you miss God's purpose. Mary here was planning a wedding, and the angel said, uh, wait a minute, there's been a change of plans. Maybe you need to plan a baby shower. <laughs> and so when life changes your plans, what do you do? Now, I, I wanna, I'm going to give you four things here real quick, but... Uh, the reason I give you these is because when God says, surprise, we've had a change of plans, it's too late to do anything about it. So if you're going to do something about it, you're going to have to do it before. You're going to have to be in advance of that change. So how can you plan, how can you prepare for God's change of plans? And, and, and when I was reading the passage about Christmas and also the one in Matthew um, I just saw all of this stuff going on and I'm thinking, God, you had to have a purpose for all that stuff you did. What could it be? 
And he said, I'm preaching a sermon. I mean, I felt, <laughs> felt like that's what came into my spirit. This is God's sermon. All the stuff that happened at Christmas is just God's way of trying to get us ready for life. This is how life is. So all of these things. So let's look at four preparations that we can make in order to be prepared when God says, surprise, uh, there's been a change in plan. All right, number one pre preparation is plan for interruptions. In life, plan for interruptions. And I hear you, especially somebody like Rick. I know he'd probably be thinking this because he's such a mechanical thinker. It's probably, all right, how in the world can you plan for an interruption when by definition, an interruption means it's not part of the plan? Well, you can't plan for interruption, but you can put two features into all of your plans that will allow you to survive interruptions to, in your life. One of the things, one of the features you can blend is margin. Now, you know, you, you say, Pastor, what you talking about? Well, you know, in, uh, in every project that uh, you have very strict uh, prints on and blueprints and guidelines, uh, there's always a little listing somewhere on there which tells you the variance, which means okay, we will allow this much variance from perfection. So you don't have to be exactly on it, but you got a little bit of room to have a little imperfection in there, and that'll be okay. So that's what margin is. Margin just means variance. It means you give it a little room. You, give, you plan things with a little room in the plan to not be perfect and still be okay. Here's the second feature you can build into your plans that'll help you with interruptions, and that is flexibility. And that means I just, you know, flexible, it means that we can, we, can take the, we can take the hit, we can go with it a little bit. We're not torn up every time something messes up our plan. Now, I bring this up and I want to show you, I want to show you how Mary did this. In verse 38, and, and I, heard, I heard Billy say amen, and several of you probably grunted under your breath amen, when Mary said what she did in verse 38. You know, Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. May it be so to me. May the words that you've spoken be so to me. The reason she could say that is because of these two features, margin and variance. Because here's what Mary was saying. Mary was saying, look, I have been, I have been planning my whole life for what my life was going to be about. And, and obviously, the plans that I've been making are different from the plans that you have for me. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, let's go with your plan. Because I know that your plan has a purpose and I understand that my plan might have been wrong. And so Mary was able to say to the angel, oh, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the maid servant, which just means I'm the servant. I'm your servant. <laughs> You're the master. Whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, have you ever had an employer, an employer ask you, uh, well, do you mind doing this? Uh, they may not say it very often, but some employers, every once in a while, you'll hear, do you mind doing this? And I always say, uh, well, I work for you. <laughs> you, know? you tell me what it is you want me to do. That's what Mary said to the angel. And she said it because there was some room in her plans for life that she could make some exceptions and some possibilities. Because uh, we all have plans in life and we all have things planned out. But have you ever noticed that some of the greatest moments in your life can come in the form of an interruption? Things that you thought were terrible and, and were just wasting your time have been some of the best things that have ever happened in your life. These moments when your plan was interrupted, but it, obviously God's plan was the interruption. Or uh, you, what happened was on the bottom shelf of your agenda, or maybe not even on a shelf of your agenda, but it was obviously on top shelf of, of God's top shelf of God's agenda in life. And so in life, the Christmas story, all these crazy things that happen that we can say, 
That was poor planning. That was poor planning. Come on, God. You didn't think that was poor planning. That, all of those things happen so that God could preach a sermon to us to say, all right, plan for interruptions in life. It's going to happen to you. Everything's not going to be made perfect. So even though you can't plan an interruption, if you give yourself a little margin to be flexible, then you can receive the interruption as the blessing that God intends for it to be. All right, let's go on to the second one. All right, first one's plan for interruptions. The second one is plan for inconvenience. And I'm not just talking about uh, the awkward inconvenience of finding yourself divinely pregnant. Explain that. Put yourself on the street, explain that. Hey, Mary, you look like you're showing, but what is this? Well, I am. I'm, I'm with child. Really? Well, I thought, you and Joe, I thought you and Joseph were spiritual people. I thought you were religious people. I thought you were going to, you know, not uh, have any fornication and stuff like that. Well, we were, but this right here is from God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, good luck with that one. I don't think that's going to work. So I'm not just talking about the, the inconvenience of being inexplicably pregnant. Uh, Got to explain it to everyone you meet every time you meet them pregnant. Got to run away for four months to be with your Aunt Elizabeth so both of you can figure out some kind of strategy about how are we going to make this kind of announcement to Joseph and not end up in a divorce pregnant. I'm talking about what about the inconvenience of actually carrying this child and ending up on a 70-mile journey up and down the mountains and the hills of Galilee and Judea around Jerusalem and on down to Bethlehem on the back of a skinny, backbone, all backbone donkey, and then when you get there, you got to have the baby without any anesthesia, in a damp, stinky, dull cave barn. Oh, look, I know all of our nativity scenes have this nice little wooden barn and this little, you know, <coughs> nice shed. But most likely at Bethlehem, according to the biblical historians, most likely at Bethlehem, the stable was more of a cave than it was a barn. And it was a place where animals were stored in this damp cave, this stinky uh, animal feel slobbering, nasty, animal feel place. I mean, look, you know, I'm thinking, God, you could have made some better accommodations for your son. How about it, you know? I mean, come on, we could have at least been born in a house somewhere with some kind of sanitary conditions, at least a little bit of them. But you let him be born in a barn and his mama just plopped off the back of a donkey. I mean, have mercy. And so, could God have made better accommodations for Jesus than he did? Well, sure he could. So why didn't he? Well, he was preaching us a sermon. And his sermon was, look, you need to prepare for inconveniences in life. There are going to be a lot of inconveniences in life. There are going to be a lot of times where it would be more convenient to go the other way than God's way. But you got to live with inconveniences in life. You got to live, you got to handle interruptions in life. The Christmas story is just a sermon that says interruptions. <laughs> let me show you interruptions. All right. Inconveniences. Oh my goodness. Let me show you inconveniences. All right. So, what will we prepare for next? The third thing is we need to prepare for imperfections because the Christmas story can get real unrealistic, can it? I mean, seriously. In our minds, we can live the perfect picture of Christmas, <laughs> right? right? <clears throat> and then we can fall in love with the perfect picture of Christmas that we have created in our minds. Right, Hallmark Channel? You've made a zillion dollars off of this. As a matter of fact, I think they've created a whole new genre of, of movies, just Christmas. They started playing them in, what, July or so? I mean, they play, started playing them in July, all 
So we can fall in love with our perfect picture of Christmas. And of course, we know that the first Christmas was perfect, right? Because all of those wonderful, sweet Christmas carols tell us all about the fact that the first Christmas was perfect. I mean, uh, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay while cattle are lowing, no, no crying he makes. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, come on, man, get real. I mean, you know, you know, Jesus laying in a, in a, in a, in a feed trough on old prickly hay. Uh, I mean, you know that wasn't perfect. I mean, is that the way it really happened? Well, let me just ask you, is that the way it really happened for you? No. Tanya and I have two children. We have now, by count, if I'm counting right, 11 grandchildren. All of them were born in a uh, nice, comfortable, safe, climate-controlled hospital. And they cried and wailed like a fire truck. Don't try to tell me that little Lord Jesus asleep on a prickly hay with the slobber and stinky animals around in some left to the, to the, to the weather of some uh, a cave barn somewhere uh, wasn't crying his sweet little head off. And I'm gonna tell you something else. He probably wasn't the only one crying. Mary had just delivered after 70 miles of bouncing around on a blooming skinny backbone of a, of a donkey and she plops down and has to have the baby right off the bat and no anesthesia. And she's probably crying, crying too about all of this stuff. And Joseph is looking around and somebody's probably accusing him, man, why didn't you think about this? You should have booked the room, man, come on. <clears throat> I mean, you know that would have made a lot, of, a lot of people roll their eyes. I'm just saying that sometimes our expectation of perfection keeps us from the celebration of progress. Let me just say that one more time because you can put that on your refrigerator if you want to. The expectation of perfection, we expect things to be so perfect that that keeps us from celebrating something that's not perfect but is making progress. Everything in life's not gonna be perfect. So in order to live life and enjoy life, we're going to have to start celebrating those things that may not be perfect, but they are making progress in life. Pregnancy is such a tremendous metaphor for carrying what God has placed in your life. And in pregnancy, I know you've noticed this, in pregnancy, we celebrate progress. Oh, look at this wonderful sonogram. This is, such, this is our baby. Look at that. You see that little blob right there in the middle? That's him. Oh, look. I, you know, I think he's going to have your nose. Yeah, look. He looks just like you. Oh, my goodness. That is such a wonderful picture. That's celebrating progress. We celebrate that because it's progress. I mean, it's something only a mother could probably even see, much less know about. But I bet you some of you got sonogram pictures in your phone right now. Where, yeah, you carry them around. I don't know why, I'm not going to show anybody, I'm sure, but it's there because that's progress. We celebrate that. And, uh, oh my goodness, isn't that so cute? She just said her first words, da-da. Now, she probably just mumbled a few syllables, but you were so excited about it that nobody can convince you that she didn't say da-da as her first sentence in life. But hey, that's okay. I mean, we're there with you because that's progress. But then we grow up. And when we grow up, we get so hard on ourselves. 
and, and, and we don't know how to celebrate our progress. We just condemn ourselves all the time. We get angry at ourselves. We get frustrated at ourselves. Why couldn't I do better? I should have known better than that. I mean, it, it, we just get all beside ourselves because we have forgotten how to celebrate progress. Everything has to be perfect or we can't be happy about it and celebrate about it. And Christmas is one of those seasons of the year that just, just amplifies this. Because God didn't wait until we were perfect to send Jesus to die for us. Romans says, but while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. And I'd just like to call attention to the fact that when God sent Jesus, that, uh, God prepared <coughs> for our imperfection. God knew we weren't gonna be perfect. And so he made preparations for our imperfection. You know what the gospel's all about? The gospel is all about the fact that Jesus stepping out of heaven and coming down to earth was not an audible that God was calling from heaven. It wasn't like God looked at the earth and said, oh my goodness, what can I do? Come here, Abraham, come here, Abraham. No, that won't do. Moses, come on, Moses. Let's try it with you, Moses. Come on, Moses. Uh, David, David, give me a moment. Come on, come on. We're going to try it with you a little bit. No, he, he, he can't do it. All right, prophets, uh, say all these things. Uh, no. Well, shoot. Jesus, it looks like you're going to have to come down here and straighten all this mess out. No. Revelation 13 says that Jesus was the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. So what this means is that God didn't say, let's try Moses, let's try Abraham, let's try David, and then end up having to turn to Jesus as some kind of an escape clause so that we could be, so that we could be saved. No, God expected imperfection. And because God inspected, expected imperfection, he incarnated perfection. Someone that would be perfect for us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So there's been a change of plans we're not going to look at our friends and expect them to be perfect. Why? Because we're not perfect either. And we're not expecting everybody to say the right things and do the right things all the time. Because why? Because we don't say the right things and we don't do the right things all the time. And so what? All the Christmas gifts don't have to be perfect. And everybody doesn't have to like what they got for Christmas. Because there's been a change in plans, and the new plans is, hey, have some eggnog, and let's celebrate. Merry Christmas. So the Christmas story tells us how to plan for life. Interruptions, imperfection, inconveniences. Let me give you one more. Plan for impossibilities. Oh, yeah. This is a great scripture for a Christmas card, by the way. I'm going to give you one. If you're a Christmas card designer... Here's a good one for you. Never, I've never seen this scripture on a Christmas card. It's uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Here's what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I think that would be wonderful on a Christmas card. Mary had her plan. Joseph had his plan. And God had his plan. <laughs> what do you do <coughs> when your plan doesn't line up with God's plan? Every time I hear that passage, Jeremiah 29, 11, read, or I read it myself, I can anticipate the, the three words in that passage of Scripture that everybody is going to get excited about. These are the words that you focus on in this passage of Scripture, and these are the words that excite you. And they are the words, and I've got them underlined for you, prosper, hope, and 
future. And so, and, and, and we plan on these because these are what we desire in life. These are the key words that we look for in life. I want to prosper and I want to have great hope for a wonderful future in life. So, these words are certainly encouraging, but they're subjective, and quite frankly, they're not within our control. So, if you want to read a verse that people really don't want to put on a Christmas card, read the one that comes right before this, verse 10. Verse 10, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 29, 10 says, this is what the Lord says. Listen to this. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. You see what God is saying? 70 years of captivity in Babylon, <laughs> then I'll fulfill my good promise to you. And then he says, I know my plans for you, verse 11, uh, plans to prosper you and plans not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. <laughs> so <clears throat> the key word in this passage must not be uh, prosper and hope because they weren't prospering and they were facing 70 years of hopelessness. The key word wasn't future because their future was 70 more years in this Babylonian captivity because they couldn't follow God's plan. So what is the key word in here? The key word to me is the word I. I know the plans that I have for you. And implicit in that statement be, would be what? God says, I know the plans that I have for you and you don't know the plans that I have for you. Verse 10, he says, I'm gonna come and fulfill my good promise. And in verse 11, he says, I know the plans that I have for you. And I bring that up because I wanna say to you that sometimes we confuse plans with promises. We get them confused, we think, because the plan changes, the promise changes. But no, just because the plan changed doesn't mean that the promise has changed. <clears throat> this plan of what just happened, this change in plan, that's not the story of your life. The change in plan is just a snapshot of your life. So he left you. He doesn't love you anymore. All that means is that somebody who was not to be a part of your life has moved out of your life and now God can place someone in your life that can be part of your future. Listen, I've, I've counseled and seen many, many weddings, couples, lives, marriages, and I'm gonna tell you, if somebody can easily just walk away from you, they were not intended to be part of your life in the first place. Because God would never tie your future to someone who could so easily just walk out of your life. So though your plan has changed, the promise has not changed. You got laid off or you got, uh, you got laid off by the mandate or whatever it might be. Well, that doesn't mean that God's not interested in your financial life anymore. God promised that he would never leave you and he'd never forsake you. God's promised that you've never seen the young lions begging for bread. God's made a promise to us. So the plans change. What does that mean? Well, the promise hasn't changed. It just means that here's an area of your life that God has an opportunity to work in, to show himself mighty in your life, to lead you to something that is quite likely a much better future than the one that you just left. Because God has constantly changed plans of everybody that he has anything to do with. Abraham, Abraham, I know you're a fat cat down in Mesopotamia. You're rich and got everything. But hey, uh, there's been a change in plans. Um, 
Moses, Moses, I know you'd like to stay on the backside of the desert for the rest of your life and tend sheep, but uh, there's been a change of plans. Hey, David, David, I know you like to take care of your father's sheep and play that soft music on that harp and that peaceful music the rest of your life, but there's a rock in your future. There's been a change in plans. God changes plans for, for a purpose. But his promise doesn't change. But he can't tell us his plan. You know why? Because we're directionally challenged. What does that mean? Well, it means if God gives us a morsel of a, of a piece of information, we'll bake a whole cake out of it. I mean, we go straight from A to point A to point B when God's line, you know, is faceted. It, it just has all these crooks and lines in there. So... We have to learn to follow God's plan, not our plan, because his purpose in our life is not to punish us, but to prosper us. So late in the night sky, around the city of Bethlehem, angels appeared to the shepherds. Yep, nasty, inappropriate, socially unacceptable shepherds. And God said to the shepherds, I got a little announcement I want you to make. There's been a change of plans. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Why did he choose the shepherds? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, why would he choose the shepherds? These people were socially downcast. These were the lowest of the society. Why did he choose them to go and say to the, everybody in the city, rejoice, be exceeding glad. For unto us is born this day in the city of David. I think it was because God wanted to use them as a testimony. A testimony of what? Well, a testimony to all of us who have ever felt like we were not good enough or we were not smart enough or we were not uh, spiritual enough or holy enough for God to use us for any good purpose. But there's been a change in plan and Christ came and was born for us so that God could fulfill his good promise. What is his good promise? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I, might, that where I am, you might be also. And the way you know, and Thomas said, we don't know the way, Lord, how can we know? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. This is God's good promise. So Jesus came so that God's good promise could come true. You know, Christmas 2021, I mean, we, we're in such a, a, a terrible time in our country, terrible time in the world. Many things to be fretful about and fearful about and anxious about. But you know, this can be the best Christmas of all. This can be a great Christmas in spite of all of that. Because I, here's what I've determined, that I'm not gonna let the ghost of Christmas grunch steal my celebration this year of Christmas. When the grunch comes to me, I'm gonna look him right in the eyes and go, grunch, there's been a change in plans. <laughs> and God will bless our lives. All right, bow your head with me just one moment. 